This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we find ourselves in the legendary time period of feudal Japan. We're all going to be different clans vying for the most victory points, and by doing that, we're going to be controlling different provinces, harvesting those provinces. We're going to be creating alliances and deals and negotiations with other players, but their non-binding, so we'll be breaking those and betraying them. We'll be going to be worshipping Kami for the different special abilities and bringing on powerful monsters to help us in our tasks. Today we're going to take a look at Rising Sun. This is from Simon. it's designed by Eric Lang, and it's for 3 to 5 players. I'm going to be reviewing the base retail version, not the Kickstarter version. Everything I show you comes with the basic retail version. Also, I've already done a sneak peek sort of overview back last year at the Simon Expo, and I also recently have produced a rule school which actually teach you how to set up and play the game. So I'm not going to do a normal overview in this, I'm just going to give you a quick one minute overview and I'll link to the other videos that I've already covered how to play this uh, at, below me in the description of this video. So without further ado, let's get started. Rising Sun is a strategy game for three to five players where each of you will take on a different clan and try to get the most victory points. This game heavily uses area control and negotiation and rewards those who are the most honorable by breaking all the ties. Over the course of the game, you'll be selecting actions throughout a political phase of bringing new figures on the map, moving them around, buying new cards, and gathering resources. But watch out because even though you're aligned with a player, you might betray them to get a powerful move. Then you go to a war phase where in specific random order each season, you'll go through different battles. Then you'll go into battle where you'll be negotiating with the people there and also blindly bidding to try to win specific war advantages. Once revealed, you see who won each advantage and then different things happen. You can win points by winning the battle itself and you can also get points even by losing the battle if you've won the right war advantage. All right, well there is Rising Sun. Again, if you wanna see more about how the game's played, you can click the links below to see my rule school or my other videos about this. Uh, let's start off with the production. Now this is the straight retail version, and even the retail version to normal board game standards is amazing. Uh, yes, the Kickstarter version has even more great things, but the reality is it's not everyone that plays this game or buys it has gotten it off of Kickstarter, and so you got sort of two crowds here. Uh, the game's amazing by itself, and it's even more amazing with the Kickstarter. So even if you're going to get the retail version, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yes, there's some cool extra things and upgraded components in the Kickstarter version. And yeah, it's better. You're going to pay more for it, but it's better uh, at this point. So amazing production either way. The rules themselves. I like how they're not overbearing. I mean, this is a 20-something page rulebook. Uh, and the rules, there's a lot of them, but they're not overbearing but it has great depth. I mean, it's pretty simple. There's really two just main phases. You're going through political mandates and you're going through war. And there's only you know, a certain amount of actions. They're all pretty straightforward. So I like that the mechanisms are pretty, actually very streamlined, easy to understand. They flow well, but yet within all that, there's a huge amount of depth. First of all, we've got that honor track for ties, which is awesome uh, because you know, 
every time you do anything in this game, you're always thinking about honor because so many times during the game, this is very tight and there's gonna be ties. So I like that. It kind of reminded me a little bit of like one of my favorite games, Nothing Personal, uh, which where, you know, one player would get the break ties, but you're always concerned about ties and working your way up trying to make that happen. And I love the honor track for doing that. It's a brilliant design idea. It's something I loved a lot about this game is trying to always consider honor in everything you do in the game. And it really comes through in the theme and the way that that actually plays a huge amount in the strategies of the game. Next thing I love is the negotiation throughout. I am a huge fan of negotiation games. I just mentioned Nothing Personal is one of my favorites. That has pretty open negotiation with non-binding deals. So does that, and that's why I love this game so much, is negotiations. You're going through the, uh, even the tea ceremony, right? You're going through there and you're talking about alliances. You're talking about what you might want to be doing that round and which player might want to join you so we can sort of stay apart or maybe help each other out. Or hey, you're gonna be going first next round. Uh, if you're gonna, if you could play a harvest for me, let's align, I'll give you some money now and we'll align, right? So you've got, even before the round really starts, there's some negotiation. And then when you're in the political phase, you've got all these other things going on with, uh, gosh, where you're going, where you're trying to go, uh, different ways you can help them out, different actions you can play for them, uh, different ways you can help people buy cards. I've, you know, there's all sorts of ways of negotiation. You can use money, you can use the Ronins, and I love how it's non-binding because you can mess people over, which you probably will need to do probably once if you're gonna wanna win this game. Uh, but I love the negotiation throughout this game. Even when you get to the battle phase, you can no longer freely give coins and Ronins, but the negotiation there, even though it's a little bit more limited, it sounds like it's actually, I think, the best part of the game. It really reminded me of one of my favorite area control games, Tammany Hall. I call this game Tammany Hall on steroids because you're doing this blind bidding, but you're kind of working things out. Like, hey, look, you and I are battling here. It's the first battle of the war phase. We're also gonna be battling in the fifth province this time. Um, I've got a lot of power over there. You've got a lot of power here. How about I don't do anything here and you don't do anything there and we'll just, we'll save ourselves for the third battle that we're each in against somebody else. You're like, okay. But then you like put one coin to take a hostage and it screws everything up. You took one of their hostage, uh, one of the people hostage and now you've won the battle and you totally turn the tables. Uh, the blind bidding is awesome. And even if you're not into that negotiation, even if you played it just quiet, the thinking of, okay, what are they gonna do? Uh, you have to know how many coins and ronins they have so you know which resources they have. You're looking at what they are, you're looking at what battles they're doing, and even if you don't like the negotiation aspect, you don't have to. The blind bidding and battle uh, aspect of this is awesome even without the negotiation, but for me it sends it over the edge with the negotiation because you're always, without it, you're still trying to think, what are they going to do? I think they're going to do this, but they might think I think they're going to do this, so they might do that. A lot of head games, a lot of bluffing, so even if you're not one of those open players that likes to negotiate, you can still have a lot of fun with this game, especially with the war and the battle part. Um, the alliances. Uh, this is really interesting because sometimes alliances always look like they're very powerful, but yet at the other side, there's really a lot of times where alliances might not be the best thing for you, especially depending on the board, what's coming up, the turn order, honor, all these different things. Because when you're alone, you don't have to give anybody else that powerful benefit uh, of your mandate tile. You're the only one getting it, so you're getting a leg up on everybody in that. Like if you harvest, you're the only one getting a bunch of stuff, hopefully no one else. Plus, anytime you're aligned with somebody, uh, when you go to war, if it's just the two of you, not, you, know, you don't have to spend anything, that's cool. But if you're in there with other people, you know, the, the allied players, you can basically, if you're not aligned with anybody, you're going to be forcing everywhere you are, you're going to be forcing somebody to spend coins that they probably don't want to do. That's going to weaken them for other battles. So you're really taking people down in that way. Also, the betray is such a powerful mandate that you can play it without losing honor. Uh, so it is good, to, to, that idea of alliances versus alone. So overall, I absolutely love this game. Now, now, I know this is very different from Blood Rage, if people said it was a spiritual successor. I think they're so different. They are very different games that obviously you can own both of these because they do feel very different. This game I absolutely fell in love with. I love negotiation, I love area control. It's got just, it's just beautiful. Uh, it's, it's streamlined and it's something, uh, it's pro I would be very surprised if this isn't at least on my top 10 best games of the year. And I know it's early, it's only February, but I couldn't imagine this not being on the top 10 of the year in my, my, at the end of the year here. Now, is there anything I didn't like about the game? Well, as you're placing figures on the map, sometimes monsters have modifiers depending on honor. Sometimes other figures have modifiers. 
And when there's a lot of figures on the map, it's hard to sort of remember and keep track of all the different things. And are they all worth one force or some worth others? And sometimes it can get hard to keep up with all the modifiers because you're trying to think of things and what you're gonna do in your turn, but yet all these things are sort of modified. So uh, we had just basically taken some little temporary sticker type things and stuck them on there and wrote the modifiers on there. We just easily took them off. We stuck one of those things on where you, where you like notate where for someone to sign on a document, one of those little like tabs. We were using those onto the minis, but I wish they would have included some type of sort of temporary way to mark a modified force because it does tend to be a little bit of an issue uh, when you're playing the game. The other one is a minor one and it's not a con for me, but it might be for you, but with this uh, negotiation that's non-binding, it might get too mean for some. Can you play the game without negotiation? Yes, you can. It's still a good game, but I think it actually, you know, the, the negotiation aspect really makes it shine. So without further ado, I love this game. Let's give it a saxophone serenade. <laughs> This video was sponsored by Miniature Market's Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com.